Once upon a time, a security guy in a large department store was wandering through the sports department, and he spotted a little boy. And the little boy would walk over one aisle, and he would look right, and he would look left, and then he would walk a little further, and he would look right, and he looked, he looked very disturbed. In fact, to the security guy, he looked lost. So he walked over to him, and not be trying not to be threatening at all, he said, hi, little fella. He said, are you lost? The little boy turned to him, had a tear running down his cheek, and he says, no, sir, I'm not lost, but my daddy is. I think I, I can hearken back to the, to the dismay of the feeling of that little fellow. I remember once when I was hunting with my father and another gentleman back up in the hills of the Ozarks. We got out there one day and we were going to hunt this patch of forest up there for deer. And my job, they, they set me in the middle and I was supposed to go straight line right down through the woods this way. My dad was going to go to make a little parenthesis around to the right and his friend was going to make a little parenthesis around to the left and they thought me, they had me in good shape because I couldn't get lost. Well, they were wrong. I got well and truly lost. In hindsight, we find, they finally figured out what I had done, that I had actually carved a nice little arc and had gone right through the path of the friend on the left off over into a part of the woods that they hadn't even intended to hunt at all. The whole thing looked alike to me, and I really had no idea. I thought I was keeping a straight line, straight as a die, and it was very disturbing when I found that I was well and truly lost. Well, my dad and his friend whistled me out of the woods, as it were, but I can tell you, getting lost is a very unpleasant experience. And that feeling of being lost is something that no one really wants to have to endure. When I thought about it, I recalled a man named Daniel who was never lost. Hundreds of miles away from his home in captivity in Babylon, Every day of his life, he went to the wall of his chamber, which was toward Jerusalem, opened the windows toward Jerusalem, lifted up his hands, and prayed toward God in Jerusalem. He did this as millions of Jews have done down through all of history, who say that when the right time comes, they either open a window or they turn toward, and they pray toward Jerusalem. I would say the chances are, right now, if I ask you in this room to point to Jerusalem, we would have fingers pointed in every which direction. I'm not absolutely sure where we sit myself, of which way I would point if I had to point to Jerusalem. But the fact of the matter is, down through history, the Jews have always done this. And I wondered, do you know the genesis of this practice? Where it comes from, where it originated, and what it means? The origins of it were come in a prayer made by Solomon and an answer that God made to Solomon himself. The prayer was made at the dedication of the temple that Solomon had built for God. You probably are familiar with the story how that David conceived the idea of building a temple. He, was, he felt badly about the fact that he lived in a house of cedar and the ark of God was in a tent. And he said, this isn't right. And he conceived the idea of building a house for God. And, and while Nathan, with God's direction, said, this is a good idea, but you can't do it, David began the preparations, which would eventually be completed by his son Solomon. And in the preparation, planning, development, and building of the temple took many years. But finally, the day came when the temple was finished. And they went, the men ceremonially went down, ceremoniously went down, and took the staves and put them through the rings that were on the ark, lifted the ark up, and with due ceremony, marched it up into the temple, through the holy place, into the Holy of Holies, and plunked it down right under the wings of the, of the carabine that overshadowed the ark. And they pulled out the, 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 the staves that they carried it with and put them in place with the handles that would protrude slightly from, from the curtain, pulled the curtain across the ark, left the building, and the temple of God, after all those years and all that work, was at that moment finished. And they came back outside. It says, and we are in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, in verse 11. 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 11. It came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place, for they were all present, they were all sanctified, they were not then waiting on the temple by course. Everybody's here on this occasion, and that's not hard to figure out. The Levites who were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, all arrayed in white linen, with cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, 
and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Big orchestra we've got here. I don't know what this would have sounded like to, uh, to the, the modern Western ear, uh, but it would have, I think, been rather unfamiliar to our idea of music. It came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking God. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. That when they finished that song, the house was filled with a cloud, even the whole temple, the house of the Lord. So the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Nobody could even stay there. The priests were on their belly to get underneath the cloud to be able to find their way or crawl their way away from there. They could not stand in this area because of the cloud that was there. Then said Solomon, The Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness, but I built a house of habitation for you, a place for your dwelling forever. And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel, and all the congregation of Israel stood up. And Solomon said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who with his hands fulfilled what he spoke by his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in, so that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. But I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name might be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. This is an interesting, it's a, an odd expression that he built a house for the name of God. Now I can almost guarantee you that the name Jehovah, Yahweh, or whatever you might think it might be, or the Tetragrammaton, was found nowhere on that building, engraved in it. It was still, though, a house for the name of the Lord our God. The Lord said to my father, For as much as it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well with what was in your heart. But, the story goes, David did not get to build the house. Solomon did. And on this occasion, at the dedication of the temple, Solomon stood before all the people on the platform that he had made. He spread his hands up toward heaven, and he led the congregation in a prayer that is, begins in verse 14. O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in the heaven or in the earth that keeps covenant, that shows mercy to your servants that walk before you with all their hearts. You who have kept with your servant David my father that which you have promised him, and spoke with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Now, therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with your servant David my father that which you have promised him, saying, there shall not fail you a man in my sight to sit upon the throne of Israel, yet so that your children may take heed to walk in my law as you have walked before me. Now then, O Lord God of Israel, let your word be verified which you have spoken to my servant David. But then Solomon asks the operative question, but will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? The idea that God would live in that temple was ludicrous. Solomon knew that. That thought never crossed his mind. Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Well, if it's not the house of God, what is it? And what's it for? He says, Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to and hearken to the cry and the prayer which your servant prays before you, that your eyes may be upon this house day and night, upon the place whereof you have said that you would put your name there. Mind you, it is not merely a matter of putting his name on Jerusalem. The name is on the house, which is in Jerusalem. He said, you would put your name there to listen to the prayer which your servant prays toward this place. Listen to the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel, which they shall make toward this place. Hear from your dwelling place, even from heaven. And when you hear, forgive. If a man sin against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to make him swear, and the oath comes before the altar in, your, in this house, then hear from heaven and do and judge your servants by requiting the wicked, by recompensing his way on his own head, by justifying the righteous, 
by giving him according to his righteousness. This building was to be the, the, the a temple of justice. It was to be the very center of justice in Israel. He said, if your people Israel are put to the worst before the enemy because they have sinned against you, if they will return and confess your name and pray and make supplication before you in this house, you begin to see what we're driving at here, why this is crucial in Israel's history. It was the prayer made in this house, in this place, where God's name was that was to be heard and responded to. Then you hear from heaven, forgive the sin of your people Israel. Bring them again to the land which you gave to them and to their fathers. When the heaven is shut up and there is no rain, another category, because they have sinned against you. If they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sins when you do afflict them, then hear you from heaven, forgive the sin of your servants and of your people Israel when you have taught them the good way wherein they should walk and send rain. Once again, every time toward this place, in this house, the prayer is heard, the sin is forgiven, the prayer is answered, God in his justice and his mercy acts. It's interesting how that he talks about the forgiveness. He says in verse 28, if there is a dearth in the land or a pestilence or blasting or mildew or locust or caterpillars, or if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatever sore or sickness there be, then what prayer, what supplication that shall be made of any man of all your people Israel, when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief, then he shall spread forth his hands <coughs> in this house. The continual references in this house and toward this place are the operative things that Solomon is asking for relative to this. And it is the place, you have to realize that the, the way in which the word name is used in Hebrew is different from ours. We, you know, when we talk about somebody's name, all we mean by that is a phonetic appellation that says that's who we're talking about. But when the, in the Bible, the, a person's name is a part of his character and his reputation, and in God's case, his authority, that God's authority was in this house. So that when one came there, prayed toward it, prayed in it, lifted up his hands toward it, that he is praying toward the authority of Almighty God who has the power to forgive, the power to give, the power to relieve sins and oppressions. He says, hear from heaven your dwelling place. Where does God live? In heaven. But the prayer is made where? In or toward this place. You know this, Father, when you, you, you render to every man according to his ways, whose heart you know, that they may fear you to walk in your ways as long as they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. And listen to this one. This is neat. Moreover, concerning the stranger which is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country for your great name's sake. And it isn't just because he heard the name, which may have fallen strangely on his ears. He's come there because of the reputation of God. If he's come here because of your great name's sake, and your mighty hand, your stretched out arm. If the stranger comes and they pray in this house. Now, a lot of people, I think, reading the New Testament would come to the conclusion that the stranger was not allowed to pray in the temple, and they would probably assume that the Old Testament didn't allow it. No, Jewish law was a problem in this regard with allowing Gentiles into the, into the holy precincts. But the law of God explicitly allowed the stranger to come and pray in this house. Then you hear from heavens, even from your dwelling place, do all that the stranger asks of you for all, so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you. So everybody knows who you are. So everybody knows your reputation. And so that the fear of God goes all the way around the world from one thing, the fact that people can come to this house, call by your name, which is your house, and be heard. And you answer. If your people go out to war against your enemies by the way that you shall send them, and they pray unto you toward this city which you have chosen and the house which I have built for your name. Then hear from heavens their prayer, their supplication, maintain their cause. Now, he goes on with this. There are several different, we, he, he attacks this question from all angles as to the way in which prayer might be made in the house, toward the house, spreading the hands toward the house, you know, looking to God, that this house was the focal point of prayer and the focus of God's name and his reputation and his authority in the earth. He says, as he begins to conclude his prayer, 
In verse 40, Now, my God, I beseech you, let your eyes be open and let your ears be attent to the prayer that is made in this place. Now, therefore, arise, O God, in, unto your resting place, you in the ark of your strength. Let your priests, O Lord, be clothed with salvation. Let your saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord, turn not away from the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of David, your servant. Then in chapter 7, verse 1, when Solomon had made an end of praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And there was not one hair on anybody's head that wasn't standing straight out by the time this was all finished, with the power of God demonstrated in the temple. Now, this was a Feast of Tabernacle season, and they kept a feast for seven days, and on the eighth day they had a holy convocation. Sometime in this, whether it's right after this or just before it, God came to speak to Solomon by night. This is down in chapter 11, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 12. And why, the reason I want to go to this is because it's one thing to hear the repeated prayer of Solomon in this place, toward this place, about this place, your name here, and so forth. Now comes the question, what does God say about this? Is this just man's idea? You know, is this just something that is a, a Jewish custom that got going somewhere back down? Or, or, or was God actually somehow cognizant of, respectful of, and accepting of this? Here's the answer. Chapter uh, 7, verse 12. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven and there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, things have gone very bad, he says. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. You know, I can't remember the first time I heard that scripture read from a pulpit somewhere. That is one of the most dominant themes you'll ever hear preached from any Christian pulpit. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, I'll heal their land. But listen to what else he says. Now my eyes shall be open and my ears attend to the prayer that is made in this place. So what Solomon asked for, Solomon got. That the prayers that are made in and toward this place will have special cachet in the eyes and the ears of God. For I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Solomon couldn't know what you and I know. And what you and I know leads us to realize immediately there's a problem here because that place is no more. The temple is not there. There have been two long periods of history and, you know, from the time Solomon finished his when there was one time only ruins there and then subsequent to the Roman destruction, nothing there. That you could actually, according to, to eyewitnesses of the time, you could actually walk by where the temple of God had been and never realize that there had been a structure there at all. But God continues to Solomon, As for you, if you'll walk before me as David your father walked and do what I've commanded you, if you'll observe my statutes and my judgments, I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I have covenanted with David your father, saying, There will never fail you a man to be a ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and commandments which I have set before you, if you shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck, pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all nations. Right from the start, if this set of things prevail, my eyes and my ears will be open to this house perpetually forever. If not, this house will not be here forever. This house which is high shall be an astonishment to everyone that passes by it, and he shall say, 
Why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? And it shall be answered, Because they forsook the Lord their God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. They laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this evil upon them. And so, as long as the house of God was there, Daniel and generations to come would pray toward Jerusalem. And even Jesus called the second temple his father's house and a house of prayer for all people. You know, he, this is my father's house. He said, you have made it into a den of thieves. And his disciples continued to use the temple as a focus for prayer long after Jesus had ascended. Peter and John are on their way up to the temple at the hour of prayer. It was a part of their lives. They knew these scriptures. They knew all of them and all of their lives, every bit of their, from the time that they were a child and came to Jerusalem for the feast for the first time, they knew that the temple was the place to go to pray to God and that one, wherever one was, prayed toward this place where God was. There seems to be in the human creature a need for a sense of place, a need to know where we are and to know where God is. And in the process of that knowing where we are and knowing where God is, we don't get lost. We don't wander around in the fog. We don't take our ship on the rocks that God is, is to be like a lighthouse to us. It's like a, a firm beacon, a rock that we can always look to and know where he is and know where we are in the process. Jews continue to this day to pray toward Jerusalem just like Muslims pray toward Mecca. It's a part of their sense of place. It's a part of their identity. And as far as I can tell, it seems to be something that is very deeply rooted in human nature. Man needs to have a focus for his prayers, a place where God is. Maybe God is up, so I will pray up. Or because it mentions that God's throne is in the sides of the north, well, maybe God's to the north. I'll pray north. Uh, maybe I should pray toward Jerusalem. I'll play, pray toward Jerusalem. And the idea seems to be that, well, we will try to, to find out where God is and we'll pray in that direction. There was a day when Jesus was in Samaria at the well of Jacob. And a woman came wandering out of town to draw water from the well, and he asked her for water. And an exchange took place between Jesus and the woman in question. And in John, it's found in John chapter 4, verse 19, it's just a short little passage. The woman said to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet, because he, some things he just said to her. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Here is the age-old sense of a need for place. For the Samaritan, Mount Gerizim was their place. That was where they actually went to observe the Passover. Their sacrifices were done there. And so everything for them was Mount Gerizim. For the Jews, it was Mount Zion, or it was Jerusalem. It was the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And this was a distinction that they made. Each of them had their own sense of place. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship because salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if some of you had actually thought of this scripture before I ever got around to going here as we develop this theme of looking to a place or looking to a building or looking to Jerusalem. But I suspect that this thing of worshiping God in spirit and in truth is a lot harder than it sounds and that it is accomplished much more rarely than we imagine that it is. And if we aren't careful, our religion and our prayer can become totally unfocused, and we can find ourselves lost. Wandering around in the dark, without a good feeling of where we are, and where God is, and what God wants from us, what God expects from us, where God wants us to go next, where we should put our feet in this little dangerous journey. And we can very easily substitute some focal point of our own making for the real thing. Because being physical, we want to look for something physical that we can not worship necessarily, but that we can use as something to focus our prayers and our attention, something we can rally around, something we can, we can deal with at a human level. They say that one of the main reasons for praying before a statue 
is not to worship the statue or the idol. The reason for praying there is because it helps the person focus his thoughts and his attention. It gives him a place and a sense of place and direction. One reason for praying in a church or a chapel is that it gives a sense of place. It gives a sense of purpose. It helps bring one into focus and somehow in doing that. I've noticed myself once in a, I was in a hospital praying for someone who was sick that I was wandering around the hospital and I came across the hospital's chapel and I went inside and I found that the quiet, the peace of the place made it a better place to pray, it seemed like, than even praying at the bedside of the one who was sick, as focused as that is as, as well. I, I really think that, that there is in all of us this need for something to bring us into focus, to make us realize where we are and make us realize what the relationships are. Now, there was a day when Jesus was going around all the cities of Jerusalem. You'll find the account in Matthew 9, and I'll begin reading in a moment in verse 35. But he keeps encountering crowds and crowds of people, and the more people he healed, the more he taught, the more people sought him out. In Matthew 9, 35, it says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among all the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad like sheep having no shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is really plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. What do you mean by all this? Well, one thing, Jesus realized that the people were lost. I mean, the temple was there, and probably some of these people prayed toward the temple. These, these parts of their lives had been there all their lives. Some of them, though, just were lost. They were sick. They were hurting. They were alone. Their families had come apart. Wife had left them. Husband had left them. Children had, 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 had gotten themselves into trouble. Who knows what kind of troubles their lives were in? And they kept coming to Jesus and coming to him, and he looked at them, and he was moved with compassion because they were fainted and scattered abroad like sheep, having no shepherd. Now, the idea of being lost entered into Christian jargon as a description of all non-Christians. You know, if you're, if you're a Christian, you're saved. If you're not a Christian, you're lost. But the word is much more profound than that. I think there are a lot of Christians in the world who are lost, even in their own faith, in that they don't know where they are, and they don't know where God is. Oh, I don't mean that you, they, that you ask them, say, well, where's God? They say, well, God's in heaven. I'm down here. But that's, I mean this in a broader and a deeper sense than just where God's throne is. They don't know where God is in their life. They don't have a sense of direction about God, and they live their life from day to day, buffeted around by whatever's going on around them, and they're lost. Christians who are lost, just like these people, who knew where the temple was. They knew when they were supposed to be down there for what festival. They knew what sacrifices they might be supposed to offer, but they were still like sheep scattered abroad without a shepherd. And I think, in one sense of the word, Jesus was also seeing their future, that the temple would be destroyed. And when the temple was gone, and when God was no longer there, praying to Jerusalem in the direction of the temple was an exercise in futility based upon the promise that God made to Solomon, he would no longer be there when the temple was gone. And this is what Jesus tried to tell the woman at the well in Samaria, and it's what he realized as he looked out and he saw these people. The dominant image in my own mind is the wailing wall in Jerusalem. The house of God is gone, and the Jews... All the people of God have been scattered to the four winds of the earth. We have a name for it. We call them the diaspora. They are everywhere, the wandering Jew. And still, people come to an ancient wall of rock, and they pray there. They have shed tears for the house of God that is gone. They write prayers on little pieces of paper and, stuck them, and stick them into cracks in the wall. And when you go there and you look at this and you feel for what has happened, a great sense of sadness is what comes upon me and the pathetic little efforts that people make to find their way back to the place where God supposedly is, whereas in fact what they're trying to find is the place where God was. Because it's not even the ruins of the house of God. 
It's all that's left of an ancient structure that was just close to the temple, an outer wall. But it's all that there is. And all around the world, Jews pray toward this place because God was there once upon a time. But just as he said he would, would, things would pass, he is not there. The house is gone, and God is gone, and all of his people are lost. They are just lost sheep wandering around the world trying to find their way, trying to, attack, to, to contact God, trying to reach out from God, praying in a direction in the hope that maybe that prayer, as Solomon said, when they spread forth their hands toward this place, I'll hear them. The problem is, it seems that God is not. The people are like sheep scattered abroad without a shepherd. Is there no place for God's people? Is there no focal point to which they can look, no place that they can rally around and somehow get an anchor down and, and realize where they are? There's a psalm. It's just one verse. You don't even need to turn to it. It's hundred right at the end, the last verse, I think, of the 119th psalm says this. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I don't forget your commandments. In other words, it's a, it's a prayer to God, come looking for me. I'm lost. And that's a, that, that is an honest, heartfelt prayer that seems to me to be really one of the best things a person can pray in the modern world when there is no temple and there's no place you can go to find God is just to say and to confess the obvious, Father, I am lost. Come get me. Because that little boy in the department store wasn't going to find his dad. His dad was going to have to come and find him. There's a prophecy I find very disturbing in, in the 34th chapter of Ezekiel. It's disturbing for a number of reasons, but one thing that it does it underlines this question of a lost person, of lost sheep, and of certain obligations that, that, that the servants of God have toward them. In Ezekiel 34, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat. You clothe yourself with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you don't feed the flock. Now, the metaphor is not that hard to figure out, is it? Because when you talk about the shepherds of Israel, you talk about the sheep, you're talking about the people out there, and the shepherds are the leaders of the people, either priests, but then, of course, in those days and time, the people who were the priests were like senators in our government today. He says, the diseased you have not strengthened. strengthened. You have not healed what was sick. You haven't bound up what was broken. You haven't brought again what was driven away. You haven't looked for those that were lost. But with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. And they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food to all the beasts on the field wherein they were scattered. I mean, the metaphors of this fall all the way down to the 20th century and to churches far and wide, some where people are cared for, many where people are not where they're merely taken advantage of and where they can be taken advantage of by cults and other people who, because those people are lost and because they are needy, they can fulfill some of their needs while they make them captives. My sheep wandered through all the mountains upon every high hill. My flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth and nobody went looking for them. Nobody looked. Nobody says, let's go find these lost sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, and anybody ought to shudder a little bit when they hear those words from God, because that is an oath. As I live, surely because my flock became a prey, my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did the shepherds search for my flock. They fed themselves and not the flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. I am against the shepherds. I will require my flock at their hand, and I will cause them to cease from feeding the flock. They'll no longer be there. And the shepherds shall not feed themselves anymore either, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth that they should not be meat for them. And then listen to what he says he's going to do. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, like a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. I'm going to go looking for them, I'll deliver them out of all the places they've been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. I'll bring them out from the people, gather them from the countries, 
and bring them to their own land and feed them on the mountains of Israel by the rivers and all the inhabited places of the country. I'll take them to good pasture. Upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. They shall lie in a good fold and a fat pasture. I'll feed my flock. I'll cause them to lie down. I'm going to take care of this, says the Lord. Because he found that he couldn't depend on anybody else to do it. Now, this passage in Ezekiel correlates very strongly to a passage in Jesus' ministry. You'll find it in the 10th chapter of John. And I'm hoping that as we work our way through this, we'll see that connection and something will begin to grow in our minds as to the, the connection between the failures of the sheep of the past, between the removal of the temple, the loss of location, the loss of place, the loss of contact with God, and the work that Jesus was going to do. In chapter 10, verse 1, he says, Verily I say unto you, He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, is a thief and a robber. He that enters in by the door, that's the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter open. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes with them, and the sheep follow him, because they know his voice. And I don't doubt that at all, that the sheep would become attuned to the voice of the shepherd. A stranger they will not follow. They'll run from a stranger. They know not the voice of strangers. Now, Jesus spoke this parable to them, and they didn't, they didn't get it. They really didn't understand what he was saying. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep wouldn't listen to them. I am the door. If by me any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but to steal and kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But the hired hand, not the shepherd, doesn't own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and runs for his life. And the wolf catches and scatters the sheep. The hired hand flees because he's a hired hand and doesn't care. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, i got to bring them too, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And I'm the growing conviction that that other sheep thing is talking about Gentiles, that he has to go after the Gentiles who have not yet been brought into that fold. Now there's one little verse in Matthew 18, you don't need to turn there because I'm not going to read it any length from it. He's talking about, first of all, the bread brought little children to him and, and he talked about some things, but he made this statement in Matthew 18 verses 10 and 11, take heed, be careful that you don't despise one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Now, somehow or other, in our generation, the word lost has, for forgive me, lost its, its cachet. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't really ring through to us. I think in Protestant jargon, like I said before, the world's divided into two classes. There's the saved and the lost. And I don't believe for a moment that using the word in the way that has been used and beat to death and, and thrown around conveys or carries with it the depth of despair that settles on into a person who is truly lost. And the realization that they are lost and the awareness of of the confusion that comes. You know, one of the things that happens to you when you're lost is you become confused. The, the directions are uncertain. Uh, things are unfamiliar around you. Everything is strange. The Nothing in your life wants to work right anymore. It's a, it's a terrible feeling to be lost. And what Jesus is saying is, there really seems to be only one way that we can rectify this thing. I am going to have to come and get you. But... There's another factor involved in this that I think churches have confused the issue still further by their doctrines of election to where the idea is that, that 
most of the people in the world are not going to ever be saved anyway. It's only the ones that are the elect that God are out there, and they're God. They are the elect. God knows they're going to be saved, and He's going to go out and get those people and bring them in, and that's the whole story. Then why is there this condemnation upon the neglect of the shepherds, if there was no obligation for these shepherds to go out themselves and get these sheep? If there was nothing they could do about it, if they weren't expected to do it if it was not their job anyway, if it was purely his. In other words, there is a confusion between the idea that we are supposed to sit still and wait for God to call people to us and become a part of the fold, and there's not much of anything that we can do about it, on the one hand, or the awareness that out there, there are hundreds and thousands of the people of God who are lost and have got to be found. And I suppose it should occur to people somewhere along the line that if we belong to Christ, if he is our Savior, if he is our Lord and, of our, and our Master, and this is his job, then one would think we would begin to realize that it's also our job. I think one of the reasons Jesus said he was, was, would build his church was to give his sheep a fold to which they could belong, to give them a place, because human beings need a place. And so a church is a good thing. So is a church building. And a minister who's a true shepherd and cares for the sheep is a real blessing. And it's a good thing to have a set of beliefs that we all adhere to because that helps us maintain shape and form and we, we are less likely to become confused in the process. And so having a, a kind of a, a modest doctrinal statement can become a very important thing so that we don't forget who we are and who God is and what direction we're supposed to be going. But I'm persuaded that you can have all these things and still be a lost soul. And all these things may be a comfort, but I don't believe that they can save a lost sheep. Because if you remember, Jesus looked out at all the, here, here was Jesus himself standing there, and there were great crowds of people all around him, and the temple was right down there in Jerusalem, and Jesus looked upon them with compassion because they were like sheep scattered abroad, having no shepherd. There was no leadership, no one to rescue them, no one to show them the way, and no one to point their feet in the right direction. So what is our rallying point? All the way down to the modern world. It's not the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. That's not where we focus our prayers and our direction. It's not where we look. And there is no temple. Is it the church? Is it a, a human leader? Is it a, a set of beliefs? a creed that we can nail to the wall and say, this is what we believe. Now, we all know better than that. Our rallying point is Christ. Now, that is very easy to say. It is not so easy to do. It is not so easy to implement, to make a part of your life in the way you live. There is no direction we can pray. There is no wall we can pray before. There is no temple that we can enter and and pray in. What we have is a Bible. And in this Bible, there are the words, the, the word of God in the person of Jesus Christ. He's our rock. He's our wall. He is our anchor. We have our churches, if they work. We have our shepherds, if they're faithful. We can have our doctrinal statements, if they're true, and we can have our ideas about God as long as our ideas do not become God's themselves. But if any of these things becomes a substitute for our rock, we'll be lost again. And we can be right in the middle of a religion, right in the middle of a church, set of doctrines nailed to the wall, and be just as lost as anyone in the world. For the pillar, the lighthouse, the rock, the wall that we have to look to is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. There is a term people use in modern business called the organizing principle. You know, what is the underlying principle that organizes this effort, that puts this thing together and makes it go? What is the organizing principle? Of the, Jew uh, the organizing principle of Jewish people was really the temple and the law, wasn't it? What's the organizing principle of the New Testament church? It has to be the words and the teaching of Jesus Christ. 
It has to be the instruction of Jesus to his disciples, and it has to also be the leadership, the steering of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our church. Now, you can go out and get in your car after church today. Don't turn it on. Don't start the engine. Sit there and try to steer it. Nothing's going to happen. You can't steer something that isn't moving. And this is the problem with being sensitive to and following the lead of the Holy Spirit in our lives. For the Holy Spirit to steer us, we have got to move. That means we have got to do something, even if it's wrong. We have got to take steps so that they can be corrected. We can actually got to actually make plans so that God can nudge us to one side or the other, and we have to implement those plans. He put us down here to learn from all of these. And the dynamic that produces organization out of chaos for the church of Jesus Christ are the words of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the commands of Christ, and the steering of the Holy Spirit. I realize that these things seem vague to us when we would prefer clarity, but I really think sometimes we have got to make certain steps on faith, and the clarity will come later. The one thing we, I think, at this point know, that it's all too easy to become sheep scattered without a shepherd and to find ourselves as lost as anybody else on the face of this planet. The place, the rock, the lighthouse, the anchor, we have to know is Jesus Christ and our commitment to him.